Good evening, Mount Nebo Church family and friends. Tonight, we give honor and praise to God for allowing us another opportunity to engage our hearts and our minds into the study of His Holy and Divine Word. Tonight, I want us to look at uh, Psalms 92 for our study for tonight. Psalms 92, beginning at verse number one, reads, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp, with a solemn sound. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. Tonight, I want us to consider for a thought, uh, my Nebo and friends, is overflowing with gratitude. Overflowing with gratitude. When we look at this psalm, this particular psalm, it reminds us that thinking, T-H-I-N-K-I-N-G, and thinking, T-H-A-N-K-I-N-G, go hand in hand. When I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, that is, I'm thanking him, shouts hallelujah. When we survey our lives as people and as individuals, it is clear to me that we have more to shout about than we do to pout about. Let me say that again tonight. We have more to shout about than we do to pout about. We have more to praise God for than we have to complain about. Again, this psalm reminds us that it is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to the name of the one who still rules heaven and earth. Consider this question for a moment. Have you ever noticed how few people appear from the looks of their faces and from their body language to really be happy? Oftentimes we get caught up in externals. We look at the external and we make certain uh, judgments. We make certain decisions based off of what we see on the outside. But that's not always indicative of how someone is really feeling. They may be smiling on the outside, but inwardly they could be crying. They could be going through a crisis. They could be experiencing something that is not comfortable in their lives. How often do you really hear people express sincere gratitude? Think about that. When was the last time you genuinely heard somebody uh, offer up sincere gratitude? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, New International Version, Paul says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Here is one, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. He says, have nothing to do with such people. Now think about that long list that Paul gives us in Timothy chapter, second Timothy chapter three, think about that long list. He, he, he tells us this is an indication of the last days or the last time of the end times. Paul says they will one be what? Lovers of themselves. But then not only will they be lovers of themselves, 
But he said they will be lovers of money. In other words, money will be more valued than their relationship with God. Money will be more valued than their friendships and relationships one with another. They will be lovers of money, boastful. You, you see more people boasting about certain things today than, than you perhaps have in a long time or even in a lifetime. Paul says they will be proud. They will be abusive, disobedient to parents. But then right in the middle of that list, he says they'll be ungrateful. I thought that was very interesting that Paul would drop that word right in the midst of the list of things concerning the attitude of people. Not only will they be lovers of themselves, but he said they'll be ungrateful. You know, that's nothing worse than to go out of your way to do something to help somebody and they don't even have what my mom, and she was here, and she would say, don't even have the decency to say thank you. Just the, the, the fact that somebody took the time to show love, appreciation, the least that we could do is say thank you. But Paul says, when we get into the last days, people will be ungrateful. They, they It's almost like they expect you to do it versus appreciating the fact that you did it. Paul says, have nothing to do with such people. So the question again comes tonight, are we really grateful? Or are we more apt to complain than to give God thanks? Don't settle for comfort without commitment. Commit to giving Thanks to God. Commit to going back and telling God how much you appreciate the blessings that he flows into your life on an everyday basis. Being thankful enables us to overcome our problems instead of being overcome by them. Either one or the other. In the midst of being thankful, you're overcoming your problems, but but when you allow your problems to rule and to reign in your life and take precedent, then the less thankful we are. When we look at verse 1 of our text tonight, in Psalms 92, the writer says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. So here it is. Gratitude honors God but it is also good for us. Gratitude honors God, but it's also good for us. Again, he says, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Why? Because it gives us a proper focus in life and the right perspective. A grateful heart keeps our minds focused on the Lord. The Old Testament reveals three important truths. One, God is holy. That's, that's first and foremost. God is holy. But then secondly, man is sinful. And number three, obedience is essential. So God is holy. That's number one. Number two, man is sinful. Number three, obedience is essential. Because Jesus was the final sacrifice we are no longer required to offer animal sacrifices. That's Old Testament. However, the principles the Lord taught through the sacrificial system is still true and applicable today. Watch this. One of the offerings he prescribed was called a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And it was performed every morning and evening. Look at Leviticus chapter 22. And I'll share verses 29 through 33 with you tonight. But look at this. It says, when you sacrifice a thick offering to the Lord, sacrifice it in such a way that it will be accepted on your behalf. It must be eaten the same day Leave none of it till morning. I am the Lord. And then in verse 31, he says, keep my commandments and follow them. I am the Lord. 
Do not profane my holy name, for I must be acknowledged as holy by the Israelites. I am the Lord who made you holy and who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. You hear that phrase continually being repeated in those verses. I am the Lord. Here's what I've done for you. I am the Lord. Here's what I've done for you. I am the Lord. Here's how I bless your life. I am the Lord. I'm the one who made ways that no man can make for you. I am the Lord. So since I have been so gracious to you, then you ought to have a spirit of thankfulness to show just how much you appreciate what I'm doing. Twice daily, offering reminded the Hebrews that the Lord God was the one who brought them out of Egypt and gave birth to them as a nation. God alone saved, God alone kept, and God alone provided for them just as he does for us tonight. Here's some simple blessings, if you will, that God provides for us on an everyday basis. I just, you may have a different list, but I just want to share a few things that I have on my list of just what we might consider to be simple blessings that God provides for us on an everyday basis. Like, that is, God gives us air. Without air, without oxygen, none of us would be alive. So God gives us air. He gives us oxygen. And the human body is designed to operate by oxygen. If you don't have air, it doesn't matter how strong you are, how smart you are. If I cut off your air supply, down goes, and you just put your name in there. So God gives us life. He gives us air. But then he gives us strength to move. Think about that. Every morning God revives us. That's why sleep is so important to the human body. The body needs time to rejuvenate itself, to re-energize itself. So every morning that God wakes you up, it is because of him that you have the strength to move your arms and your legs. But then God gives us family, for love, for fellowship, for sweet communion. God gives us automobiles to drive. God gives us a place to live. We don't have to live outside under a bridge. We don't have to eat out of a garbage can. God provides our daily necessities. But then he gives us a mind. He gives us a mind that should indicate to us that I have a Lord, I have a master, and since I have a master, I ought to return and give him thanks. When I think about that, I think about the 10 lepers in the New Testament. You, you know there were 10 that were unclean when they met Jesus. And Jesus said, here's what y'all do. Go and show yourself to the priest. And all the way to see the priest, all 10 of them were clean. Y'all know that story. But only one of them, who was a Samaritan, an outsider, came back and fell down at the feet of Jesus. Now, look at that. You got 100% that was healed, but only 10% had the guts and the nerve to return and say, thank you, Lord. I wonder tonight, which of those classes do you sit in? Are you in the 90 percentile who's so caught up in religious exercises that you don't remember the one who healed your body? Are you so caught up in religious exercises that you don't remember it was he who made you and not you your own self? Or are you in the 10 percent who says the priest can wait because I met the priest of all priests. I met the king of kings and the lord of lords and I'm going back to tell him thank you. Which class do you sit? Are you in the 90 percent time? Or are you in the 10 percent who says, I'm going back and I'm going to fall at his feet and I'm going to worship him because I was in a state where I couldn't even socialize because lepers were in their own separate colony. They couldn't 
Doesn't matter who their family was, if you had leprosy in biblical times, you were separated from the rest of the community. Only folk you saw were people who were in the same condition as you. And since God healed you and brought you out of that, you ought to say, Lord, I thank you tonight. Look at this, Psalm 50 and verse 23. New International Version says, those who sacrifice, thank offerings, honor me. Those who sacrifice, thank offerings, honor me, and to the blameless I will show my salvation. When we acknowledge God as the source of all of our blessings, we are exalting him by declaring our dependence on him. So, appreciation, Mount Nebo, helps us realize that we cannot make it through this life without God's help. No. But it doesn't matter whether you acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior or you don't acknowledge him. You and I cannot make it through this life without his help. So a spirit of thanksgiving is the result of remembering all that God has done for us. God chose us before the foundation of the world. We are eternally secure. We have been given gifts according to the Holy Spirit. The Lord provides our needs. We have divine protection every day. That's danger seen and unseen. We have an eternal home in heaven and the promise of the resurrection. God loves us unconditionally. Hmm. That's remembering all that God has done for us. Not only the little list that I have, but these are all from the Bible that we know and have been taught of what God has done for us through his son. True thanksgiving has a powerful impact on our lives. Here's what it does. It motivates us to look for the Lord's purposes in everything in our lives. Motivates us, motivates us to look for the Lord's purposes, everything in our lives. It reminds us, now I like this one. It reminds us of our finiteness and God's eternality. That is, we have an expiration date. We, we were, because of what Adam and Eve did in the garden, we were sentenced to death. That is, there's going to come a day where you, gonna, you and I are going to check out of here. But God is from everlasting to everlasting. He says, I am Alpha and Omega. So it reminds us that none of us are here forever. Mm -mm. Then number three, it removes anxiety. True thanksgiving has the power to impact our lives in this way, that it removes anxiety from our lives. Why? Praise and gratitude drives out our fears and our anxieties. The more I praise him, the more he blesses me. And blessings don't just come in, in financial ways. Blessings come with just peace of mind. That's a blessing. Blessings come with joy unspeakable that I can be going through something and still have joy. That's a blessing. But then it also keeps us focused on the Lord. The situation may not change, but our attitude will. The more I look at him and look up to him, I may be still going through, but my attitude changes about it. Then it energizes us physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. True thanksgiving. That's what it does. Let me tell you this. You got to handle discouragement without discouragement handling you. Handle discouragement without discouragement handling you. Hmm. We talked about this on Sunday from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Paul says, rejoice always, 
Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The devil's most utilized and effective tool is discouragement. If he can discourage you, it it it, it just it kills everything. You you won't have you won't have a desire to get up to go to work. You won't have a desire uh, to 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 praise God. You won't have a desire to be around other people. It, it'll just it, it, your life will begin to dry up if you don't get a handle on discouragement. It it becomes like a cancer. It begins to eat at you and eat you up. But when you get a handle on discouragement, then, then you are making a way for God to do a miracle in your life. So the question becomes, why is this tool of the enemy, why is this tool called discouragement so effective? One question the devil said, it's more useful to me than any other tool. When I can't bring down my victims without with any of the rest of my tools, I use discouragement because so few people realize that it belongs to me. Y'all hear me tonight? The enemy of joy is discouragement. The enemy of joy is discouragement. It causes one to quit. And are we going to learn to live productive lives, we've got to learn to overcome the spirit of discouragement. The more discouragement a person can overcome, in a sense, the greater that person is. Let me say that again tonight. The more discouragement a person can overcome, in a sense, the greater that person is. There are three options. Dealing with discouragement. And I'll give you these three and I'll let you go for tonight. Three options with di for dealing with discouragement. The first one is simply to give in to. That's the first one. To simply just uh, resign and just give in to discouragement. To allow it to overwhelm you and to take over your life. To allow it to eat at you. To cause your focus to become more on the negative than the positives of life. To cause you to become depressed pessimistic and hopeless. The light at the end of the tunnel may be just another train coming at full speed. That's what happens when you just simply give in to discouragement. You, you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You just see another train headed your way. When we simply give in, we see or sense no chance of things becoming better or turning around. But then secondly, we can deny the problem. When we're talking about there's three options for dealing with discouragement. We can deny or just act like there's no problem at all. In denying our problems, we either minimize them or we spiritualize them saying, praise God, it doesn't matter. But that's not always the case. In denying our problems, we also deny the power that is available to us. Then thirdly and finally, we can face our problems with realism and with faith. That is, thanking God in the midst of discouragement. Each morning is a new opportunity to give thanks to the Lord God. The time we most need to be thankful for God's bountiful blessings is when we feel the least grateful. Let me say that again. The time we most need to be thankful for God's bountiful blessings is when we feel the least grateful. Let me close with this. Psalms 97. Real quickly, I won't dive into this, but I just want to share a few verses from Psalms 97. Psalms 97, along with Psalms 92, Psalms 92 encourages us and tells us that it's a good thing to give praise and to praise God. But then Psalm 97 reminds us of something. It reminds us not only of something, but it reminds us of someone. Watch what the opening of Psalm 97 says. It says, the Lord reigneth. The end of discussion. 
If you know the Lord reigns and that he reigns forever and ever, then you know that God still has the power. God still has the ability to bring you out of whatever you are going through at this present time. He reminds us the Lord reigns. And since God still reigns, he says in Psalm 97 that the earth should be glad. Somebody tonight ought to be glad that God still reigns. As long as God rules and reigns, we can be joyful even in the midst of discouragement. Why? Because God is over all things. Amen? God is over all things. So again tonight, our aim and our focus for our lesson is overflowing with gratitude. Don't allow the times which you may be going through. Don't allow bitter moments in life to cause you to become bitter. But rather remember that the Lord, that is a good thing, according to Psalm 92, it's a good thing to give praise to God, to worship God, be thankful unto God. But then Psalm 97 tells us that the Lord still reigns. And since he still reigns, there's still opportunity, there's still time for God to work a miracle in the midst of your mess. So praise him tonight that he's still a way-making God and he's not through with you yet. Let's pray and we'll be called. Father, we thank you again tonight. For what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, but most of all, Father, we thank you for what our hearts have felt. It is my prayer tonight, God, that you allow this word to saturate the hearts and the minds of your people. They will be encouraged in spite of what they may be going through right now. That their faith would be stabilized. That their minds would be regulated. Keep us now, God, as only as you can. No matter how the storms of life may be blown, no matter how the rain may be falling, our hope and our trust is in you, the sovereign one. Keep us now, forever in your care. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Until next time, overflowing with thanksgiving. God bless you and keep you is our prayer.